Kia ora Aotearoa, welcome to Whitehead Fifth Estate, brought to you by the Aotearoa Credit Union. This is where we wrap the most important news events with the best political panel on television. Streaming live on the dailyblog.co.nz, whateartv.com and broadcast on Face TV, Sky Channel 83. Remember, you can send in questions during the show off the whateartnews.org or dailyblog.nz platforms. Joining us tonight as part of a three-night special on welfare and poverty in the studio, human rights activist, former Green Party MP and head of Auckland Action Against Poverty, Sue Bradford, economist, honorary associate professor at the Auckland University School of Business and economy spokesperson for CPAG, Dr Susan St John, and the CEO of Mangere Budgeting Services, Daryl Evans. Tonight, on the eve of the fourth Auckland Action Against Poverty Beneficiary Impact Clinic outside Mangere Work and Income, we ask why have beneficiaries become political footballs and what does it take to change minds? Sue, so, uh, thank you so much for joining us. What is a beneficiary impact and why are you doing it? Um, this is the fourth impact that Auckland Action Against Poverty has run. For three days we go outside one work and income office with a large crew of advocates mm -hmm. and help people to access their full entitlements over that three days. So it's a very concerted effort, yep. a massive logistical exercise on our part. We yep. have over 100 volunteers out at Mangere this week. A massive exercise on MSD's part as well because they're putting on 30 extra staff. Right. And over the next three days we hope to um, help over 700 people get the thing, uh, benefits and other entitlements that they should be getting anyway but they're not and it's a real indictment of this government that a group like us has to do this. It seems <sighs> like hearing you explain it just seems almost inane. <laughs> You're helping the beneficiaries get their entitlement. Sh shouldn't, <laughs> shouldn't, shouldn't WINS be doing that? Uh, work and income certainly should. I spent 10 years as a Green MP trying to tell a Labor government That's right. that every day when someone works into, walks into work and income, they should get everything they're entitled to as a matter of course. People like Steve Mahari swore black and blue that they were doing that. They never did under a Labor government. Under National, it's got even worse with policies deliberately geared to trying to keep people off benefits as much as possible or to keep for those that are on benefits to keep them on as reduced a level of, of assistance as possible. So it's very deliberate. This isn't happening by accident. It's right. a deliberate government policy with their new investment, they call it investment approach to welfare, yeah. which means it's all about saving money. But what is never counted is the true cost in homelessness and acute poverty right. and the people we see every day in our organisation who simply don't have enough food, um, much less anywhere, often nowhere to live. And I'm yep. sure um, Daryl will see the same people every day as well. We just see them on mass during the impact. What have you seen from previous impacts? What, what, have, what have been some of the stories, some of the situations you've had in the previous impacts that have really just sort of rocked you a little bit? Oh, a young woman from a Pacific Island country who should have been on a sole parent benefit for the previous two years had simply not received that benefit at all for two years. So her extended family was having to support her throughout that period because she had language and sure. cultural issues sure. with work and income. It's things like that, absolutely uh, appalling situations that people find themselves in. So the pressure goes not only onto that woman and her children, but and onto her whole entire right, family and community right. around her. And there's so much of that hidden um, poverty where people are not often getting nothing when yep. they should be. They're entitled to these things, but they're not getting it because you know, the government's doing it every can, everything it can to keep the numbers down. Uh, Daryl, there is this offensive, uh, simplified stereotype that drenches all political discussion about poverty, that the poor are blowing their money on ciggies and booze and not doing the best for their children. You're on the front line of helping the poorest manage their money. How true is that stereotype? Well, I can honestly say 95% of the families that I work with are good, honest people. They want to be the best parents. They want to sustain the rent. Yeah. They want to put good, healthy kai on the table. The reality is they don't have enough. Now let's just look at the 5%. Yeah. Possibly 5% do play the system. Maybe you know they're on more benefit they're entitled than they're entitled to. They're not, they're not disclosing everything. But overwhelmingly, the people who come into my service are mum and dad New Zealand that want to be the best parents. They sure. want the best for their kids. They want them to grow up and have better than they had. I come from a very large, poor Welsh family. My parents had very little. You know, they, they were born poor, they lived poor, they died poor. Right. 
and what my mother wanted for her nine kids was that we all had better and for the most part we've achieved it it astounds me in a country that's given me a better life I came here because the grass was greener yep. and I've got a great life you know great partner and a couple of great kids yep. but it just astounds me that average Kiwis are prepared to stick the boot in and say beneficiary solo mother lazy if one more person asks me why females have too many kids and they use offensive terminology like why aren't they closing their legs yeah I find it morally and personally of offensive and it actually sickens me to the core that people think it's okay to make those comments and judgments on people that are living really tough lives. Is that, is that an ingrained sexism? Because I, you, 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 whenever there is a case that comes out, if, 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 if the woman has children, anything sort of over one, mm. um, there is all, you're right, there is a huge amount of moralistic crap that seems to be attached to that decision. And it's almost like open, open sleigh to just throw everything at them. Well, I'll give you an example. Three weeks ago, I was invited to a, a church um, as a guest speaker on a Sunday. The, yep. the topic was poverty and passion. Yep. Um, and I thought church, you know, not non, non um, judgmental. Yep. Yep. I saw this lady in the front row, you know, okay, lady, constantly trying to ask the question. And eventually she asked the question and she said, you've just spoken about the lady who's had a heart, heart transplant, mm. living in a garage with her five kids. What are you doing to educate her to stop bereading? Yeah. You know, I, I, it's, I felt like walking out of the church, but the reality is, as a budget service, and as, as three professionals, we're not here to judge people, no. but we are here to support me, people to make smarter choices with what little they have, sure. so that they can lift their kids out of poverty and their kids can go on to have more productive and, and better lives. Is it a lack of empathy? Oh, totally. There's very, very, I've said it for a long time, there is no empathy for the poor in New Zealand. People are blinkered. And even with my own circle of friends, I've got friends who have money, I've yep, yep, friend, yep, friends yep, who are on yep, a benefit, yep. and I have disabled friends. It astounds me that those who live in the more affluent communities, you know, the Ponsonby, the Greylands, yep. they will say, well, why are these people making bad choices? Why aren't they on the pill? You know, why have they decided to keep having more kids? Is it because they get a, a, a bigger state house? Is it because they get a, a, a bigger benefit? No, there is a, there's a multitude of reasons why people have children. Yes. Cultural, religious, who are we to judge? You know, if, so, yes, in an ideal world, everybody would be working, everybody would be in nice, comfortable houses. We don't but the live in an ideal is, world, right? Well, last year I was asked the question, is Auckland the most livable city? And I was a guest speaker at this conference. Yeah, yeah. Yes, for those who have money. Right. But there is an underclass, there is a forgotten Auckland, which most Kiwis do not want to talk about. Susan, why are the politics so bloody difficult here? Is it legitimate to argue for a Darwinian survival of the economically fittest as morally preferable? to what we've got right now. Well, of course it's not. And I just take my hat off to the AAAP and the work that Daryl does at mm. the front face, seeing mm. this and coping with all this ridiculous feedback from the affluent in New Zealand. And listening to what Daryl was saying there, I kept thinking as an economist here, we have these people that are our future and they're going to be on this planet maybe for 70 years and we're not prepared to invest in them. It seems to be a death wish. Ah, culturally it does. Yes. How do you interpret government data claiming benefit numbers are down? Well, they're pushing people off benefits. So, so they're just coming up with excuses to throw them off. That's, we that's just know the... so little about what's actually going on. Shouldn't and we? Well, of course we should. We should have far more data. Um, it's, it's appalling actually, you ask under the Official Information Act for all sorts of things yep. and there's all sorts of reasons why you can't have it or when you get it, it's got a whole lot of stuff blacked right. out. Right. But we used to get regular statistical yep. reports that yep. actually told us something. It's extremely concerning. I mean, just picking up on what Sue was saying about people coming and not knowing what yep. their entitlements yep. are. One of the things that the government seems to have done is to make things so complicated that people actually don't know mm. what it is they're entitled to. That's just, that just so, seems insane. So that just seems absolutely counterproductive mm. to everything we should be trying to do with our citizens. Yes. If they don't know what their rights are and yes. they don't know what they're entitled to, how, how can they... How, how can they? And what's happened is that the core benefits have become squeezed yep. over time 
And so there has been the need for all these add-on entitlements that multiple natures of them, which right. are very difficult for people to know. So, I mean, the, the, just, just getting back to that, that, that purposely, that the purpose, purposeful creation of, um, of bureaucracy that seems destined to catch people out. We had a look at the, 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 the amount of paperwork it takes to um, get the dole in, in, yes. in the, 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 to, to, to be a job seeker. 77 pages is what they give mm. people when they're trying to get that. Mm. Most mortgages are less than a dozen pages. Mm. How is it that a mortgage mm. can be less than a dozen pages, yet, yet, yet when someone who's trying to get um, uh, 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 money to keep the bills paid um, through no fault of their own, have to jump through 77 bloody pages mm. of dense text, which I would be, I would find difficult getting through. Well, you asked for the political reason, and I think it's around this desire to tightly target, even more tightly target. So it's only the poor and everyone else must be excluded from any benefits. So Natasha Fuller had her privacy breached when she publicly challenged national's policies. Wheelchair-bound uh, Sam uh, Kuha took a hammer to his wins office to protest and beneficiaries are thrown off welfare at every given opportunity. Can wins be reformed or is it part of the problem? Um, it's certainly part of the problem at the moment, but I do see that reform could come from the top if, if we had a government that actually was determined to change both the um, law regulation and the culture of working income. It doesn't yep. have to be like it is. If you had good law behind it and if you had a culture that respected the people that come for help and said that actually everyone in these certain situations deserves what assistance the state can give. If you just switched it round, it wouldn't take much. If you put in good people at the top, good law, good regulation, it would mean a total rewrite of the Social Security Act, not yep. the sort of rewrite they're planning at the moment, um, for a system that was much fairer. It would mean giving people benefits that were actually in enough to live on because yep. we need to remember that the 1991 benefit cuts have never been restored That's right. under either never. national or Labour led never. governments and Labour actually hammered in and, and put in as Susan knows very well um, even worse um, discrimination against beneficiaries than what national had done previously and so the systemic discrimination and determination to disenfranchise this whole big part of our population has just got worse and worse um, and so it's up to us to try and um, persuade political parties to try and influence the political system, which is why we do demonstrations and pickets, because um, we really have no party in Parliament standing up for us strongly at the moment. And, it's, and, it's, and it's why you're so bloody angry on the streets, because there's plenty <laughs> to be angry about, right? Yeah. There's a lot to be angry about here. Uh, are beneficiaries just whipping boys? Are they, are they, are they the go-to scapegoat that, that, that allows us to ignore everything else that goes on in New Zealand? We just blame them so that they're the problem, it's got nothing to do with the neoliberal structure of government that we've had for the last 30 years. Is, 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 is well, that, they're, 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 the, they're the targets? Uh, they're almost, uh, beneficiaries and unemployed people are almost out of the public discourse as far as uh, the sort of, yeah. the people that, mm. um, mm. back in the 90s, um, beneficiaries were vilified very openly. They yep. even ran, government ran advertising campaigns Dob in a bludger, a That's actually right. targeting beneficiaries. We don't see that sort of thing now. I think it's more just a very deliberate diffidence at ignoring and just these people don't exist, it doesn't matter. Um, even John Key will sit there and say, oh no, we care about children in poverty. They'll yep. talk about it, but yep. they won't do anything about it. Right. Um, so children are okay, but of course child poverty is actually about adult poverty because it's the adult incomes and housing yeah. that determines whether a child's in poverty. Yeah. Those connections are never made. Mm. Um, and so it's it's a deliberate, yes there are whole sections of the population that despise and put down beneficiaries but at the same time I don't feel that from the system overall it's more just oh, we don't have that kind of poverty in New Zealand if we ignore it, if we don't talk about it, if our mass media ignores it yeah. or only talks about the pitiful cases and not about the structural yep. issues, yep. Um, it doesn't matter because if I'm okay, if I've got a house, if I've got somewhere to live, if I'm, my kids are doing okay, if I've got decent clothes to wear, uh, it's not my problem. So it's a self-interested denial? Yeah, which is deliberately cultivated by yeah. our political masters. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so it's up to people like us and, yeah. and good on um, child poverty action and the work that they're all. Absolutely. Groups like our, the ones we're part of and many others are actually yep. pivotal in this. Yep. But um, we need to make our voices louder and stronger. Daryl, there was much fanfare over national lifting benefits by $25. How did that impact many of the people you see? in real terms? Well, I guess it's got to be acknowledged, excuse me, <coughs> it's got to be acknowledged that 
any increase is better than no of course, increase. Of course, of course. But you've got to look at this, the, the, the opposite side of the pendulum. 63% of the families that I work with, which is around 3,500 families annually, are paying 65% of their weekly income to a private landlord. So the reality is $25 maybe pays for an extra meal one, you know, one night a week. Right. But when you're paying 65% to the landlord and then you've put a bit of money into the meter to put the electricity on, yep. there's very little left over to put good quality food on the table. Right. And so demand for services like budgeting is at an all time high. Yep. The vast majority of the 170 budget services around this country have a two to three week waiting list. Wow. Um, and I would say that on a daily basis, the, the second request from every client is food. Right. So we opened a, a food bank two years ago. We're one of the largest food banks in the yep. no North Island. Yep. Um, almost every second person coming through the door. Now, what's interesting is that not all of those people are beneficiaries. Right. They're the, the working poor? Th the working poor. They're yep. the, the minimum wage earners on 15.25. You and I both know that 15.25 doesn't cut the mustard. Yeah. One of the things that I, I keep, keep saying is that when I came to this country 26 years ago, a full-time job was 40 hours. Five years later, it was 37 and a half, then 35. Many employers, including working income, can now consider a full-time job to be 28 hours. Wow. Because it's playing with numbers. It's right. We've moved this number of people into a full-time job. Well, in actual fact, you've moved this number of people into a part-time job. Right, in, in my, right, in my right, opinion. right, right, right. So food insecurity is absolutely on the increase. And we do a lot of work with local schools in, in providing any excess food we have, we give to breakfast clubs and sure. for school lunches. Sure. You know, and we're hearing that the, the, the majority of schools, it's Southern Cross Campus tell us, 80% yeah. of their kids go to school with a packet of raw noodles, wow. not a cooked packet with hot water and you make it into a, yeah, into yeah, a yeah, soup. Yeah, 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 it's yeah. raw noodles because it's cheap, apparently tastes good, but you know, it's unbelievably unhealthy. Yeah. But that's because, it's not because people are, are not good at cooking, it's because there's nothing left over. Got some um, questions coming through. Uh, this one's actually directly for you, uh, Daryl. How much personal debt are families in crisis carrying, which includes exorbitant, exorbitant uh, interest rates? What, 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 what's the Well, we, we've done very rough studies. We, yeah, yeah. we look at the level of debt of, of people coming across the door, whether they're beneficiary or working. The average beneficiary coming into our Mangere office, and remembering we have offices in Mangere, Otara, and now Tuakau, yeah. is about $24,000. Wow. So that's bad debt. Right. Predominantly, it's cars. So most right. people have two cars. Yep. More often than not, only one of them works. Yep. Um, you, interest. You, you need a, you need a car to get to work, right? Well, that's the re reality. Right. Is if you need to get a, get to get to work, if yep. you need to drop the kids off at school, you need a car. Right. I've just worked with a young guy. He ended up going to Australia, and I said to him, "Don't go to Aussie. Face the debt." Yeah. He bought a car for for seven thousand dollars with interest. It worked out to be twenty two. The the mm. gearbox went very quickly. Now he had bad credit, so he couldn't borrow nine hundred to fix the gearbox. Right but he could borrow another 7,000 to buy the second car. Oh, well, the reality is that's... three years later, he's got yep. three cars, two don't work, yep. one does, but he's still now got a t combined debt of about 37 grand. Right. Jumped the plane, went to Australia, uh, Vida Advantage found him very quickly. He's, right. he's now back in the country trying to confront the debt. Yep. So with regards to high interest rates, we are, we are seeing a range. The highest would be a company called Online Finance. They're about 603%. Yep which is completely and utterly obscene, yeah. and more needs to be done to regulate, regulate interest. Now, I remember, would have been 12 years ago, I was on Breakfast TV with Judith Tizard, yep. the, the then Labour Minister, and I was saying, you know, you've, you've, you've got to cap interest rates. And she said, but Daryl, you, you push these companies underground. Yep, yep. Wake up call, they're already operating in Mangadi out of the back of garages, $2 shops, the local Indian dairy. Right, right. When you're desperate, you'll almost agree to any interest course, rate. Because if you need the car to get yep. the kids to school, yep. whether, the, whether it's 54% or 554%, you'll take the credit from whoever is going exactly, to say yes. Exactly, Susan, um, this, this statistic just, it, uh, work, walk me through this, because this just doesn't make any sense. 59% of job seeker and sole parent beneficiaries owe money back to wins because of overpayments. Aren't, aren't we in fact enslaving these people into never ending mm. debt with wins? Mm. For how, all sorts how is, of reasons. How is that, how is that possible? It, it's not just for overpayments, but um, well, for repayment of... Susan and I were just talking before we came in. 
<coughs> I met a young woman today who's 21 years of age. Um, MSD have told her she owes $22,000 in debt. The repayment plan that they've come up with show, well, we worked out that she will be 47 by the time she pays that debt off. Now, she doesn't even acknowledge the debt. They're saying, well, she lived in a relationship. She saying, no, he was simply a boyfriend. But she didn't start the relationship until eight months after they're claiming that it, that it started. There's a lot of this going on. And how, we are very how concerned. Walk, walk me, uh, uh, explain it's, this to me. Well, for some reason, if you are in a relationship, it's supposed to be easier to live than if you were simply two single people sharing. How? Well, I don't know, but that's what the rules say. Right. So that if one's going to establish that there is a relationship, it actually saves them money. Uh, but unfortunately, if they come along, say, three or four years later and yeah. say, you were in a relationship from this date, right. then there is all that debt to repay. And people can go to prison for it, even with children. It's, it's like it's the 19th to prove century. You're not in the relationship. How, how is it yes. hard to prove? Well, the, this lady today was saying, well, how do I prove that we were not together? Yeah. Because, of course, I mean, I, I've heard this from government officials. The number one tool they use to find out if there's fraudulent activity, whether it's MSD or House in New Zealand, is Facebook. Unbelievable. And so they, they, they scroll Facebook, they're looking for photos. Who's the man in the picture? How often does he come to the house? You know, you're in, in my opinion, you're entitled to have male friends, with, you know, if you're, if obviously mm. if you're female or male. Um, it shouldn't, you, you shouldn't be having to explain why you're in a relationship. This is, this is, but this is bizarre this behavior from, for, from for forever. a very long time yes. Martin, um, relationships and the nature of marriage and the inquisition and inspection and uh, it's it's as bad as any totalitarian state yeah. we can imagine and this is yes. another thing that upside New Zealanders who haven't been in the benefit system have no idea what happens and right. how under scrutiny you are if you're on a benefit um, and they for any reason think that you're in a relationship um, that you haven't declared. Um, as Susan said, um, far too many, uh, particularly women, go to jail for right. this and they, their lives are destroyed, their children's lives are destroyed and then they still carry this massive debt. It I hope the mm. person, uh, the woman that Daryl's talking about, I hope she fights that all the way. We're yeah, helping yeah, yeah good, because we'd certainly um, yeah. fight that all yeah, the way. I mean, yeah. you have to, but so many people can't get yeah, help. Of course, of course. Uh, Sue, so to mm. go back to your point about the dobbing in, there are <laughs> instructions on the website as to how to dob people yeah, in they encourage for this so-called crime. And what worries me about mm. the case that Daryl is talking about yeah. is that that poor woman has probably been told, well, look, the easiest thing to do is just plead to guilty, right? Plead guilty yep, because yep. otherwise, how are you going to fight it? You know, who's going and to fight to it remember, for you? And we have to remember, just within my service, 83% of the people that come across our door are English as a second language. Right. Now, that's not to say that they're stupid people because they're not, but they, they have language barriers. Yep. And so yes. when you have an investigator telling you that, that we have somebody, and these are the words that she told me today, yep. we have somebody who's going to stand up in court and testify against you, but they won't tell you who that person oh. is. You know, it, 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 just it, it just seems obscene that we have government departments that are effectively ch spying on people's private lives and popping into their bedrooms to decide whether or not they've got relationships, finding out that they do, and then punishing them with these obscene mm. amounts of money, mm. which they charge interest on top as well, don't they? Oh, this no, is the, the no, there's, oh, thank God for that. no, there's well, no don't, interest on this. Ideas. But <laughs> the reality is, how does she break out of that cycle? Right, yeah, 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 know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just from a mindset, yeah. and, and a lot of our clients do have mental health issues. Sure. If somebody sent me a letter saying that I owed twenty, thirty thousand dollars in debt, and I knew that I wasn't going to get out of it until forty-seven, if I was twenty-one, yeah. What does that do to you? Right, absolutely. You're, you're, you are you are indebted for life, right? Absolutely. Uh, so Paula Bennett started this year by suggesting we could deal with poverty and housing affordability if we move large chunks of South Auckland to Ashburton. Um, <laughs> how much of a solution is that? Well, it isn't. And um, since she first uh, broached that idea, it sort of disappeared down a dark hole. Thank goodness, because yeah. it was so ridiculous. And you had the she was saying Pacific Island people should move to these South Island towns for a better future with housing and jobs. And the Pacific Island leaders in, in at least one of those towns yep. went on national TV and said, "Where's the jobs? Where's the housing?" Yeah, we're here. So Paula <laughs> Bennett obviously had no idea actually about the situation of that town, right. much less the whole idea that somehow we ethnically cleanse Auckland, both of Pacific Island people mm. and of poor people, yeah. by pushing them into some um, other location. Daryl, what would make, uh, what would the difference of a living wage make to the people using your budgeting services? 
Well, I, I absolutely believe we've got to get rid of this nonsense of having a minimum wage. Yeah. People have to be able to live. Yeah. They have to be able to participate in the community. And one of the things that I say regularly is that the people coming to our service are not telling us that they want a fortnight in Fiji, <laughs> although that would be very nice, thank you very much. Sure. What they want to be able to do is they want to be able to sustain the, the rent, keep the roof over their kids' heads, pay the power, pay the debt, and put quality food on the table. Pretty basic, They right? want their children to be able to participate in, in sporting activities in the community yep. and maybe be able to take them for an ice cream once a week, once a fortnight. You know, we live in a great country, and yet I, there is a, nearly 300,000 children living in, in what I consider extreme poverty, mm. and yet 40% of those households have at least one person working full-time. It's a disgrace. Yeah, we, is, we've got is. mothers and fathers working three, four jobs. They're not seeing the kids. As the mum goes to work, the father's coming in. Mm. You know, yeah. it, it, something's got to be done, so we absolutely need a livable wage. How, just another question here. How effective do you guys think Labor's UBI in addressing uh, poverty would be? Any ideas? Well, so? they haven't actually stated what their UBI yep. is, and um, until you actually see the numbers yep. and, and the figures on what they're doing and how, yep. um, it, UBI, uh, our AAAP totally supports a progressive universal yep. basic yep. income, which means people are not on that would be on benefits now would not come into it less at, under, under yep. what yeah, we're yeah, on yeah, now, yeah. and in fact, in many cases they need more. So it's actually quite yeah. dangerous. To, uh, it's good that La Labor's thinking about it, but we need but more it's detail, dangerous right? without the details. Susan, we can crucify. <laughs> beneficiaries for not understanding mm. the complex mm. rules of eligibility but we can't seem to do anything about the billionaires caught out today <laughs> using New Zealand as a tax haven for the yeah. billions of dollars. Yeah. Why is that? Well uh, that's too big a question. I don't really understand why. Yeah. <laughs> yeah neither do I. Um, okay <laughs> Look, uh, we have to wrap the show but before uh, we do let's get a final word uh, from each of our panellists. Um, Sue, what do you think um, we need compassion-wise uh, towards towards beneficiaries to make a real difference? How are we going to make some real difference here? Uh, completely change the system to one that puts people before profit. Yep. Mm -hmm. Daryl? I think we absolutely need to value the children of these homes. It's all very well sticking the boot in and kicking the mum and kicking the dad. Mm. It's those kids that live with those words. Mm. and. We've got to do everything in our power to embrace them and lift them out of poverty and tell them that they can be anything they want to be with a little bit of hard work and a little bit of effort. Susan? Well, I would like to see some of the principles of the universal basic income implemented now mm -hmm. so that it should be easier okay. to earn extra money yeah. mm -hmm. when you're on a core benefit yeah. and we shouldn't have this nonsense of the relationship determining how you're treated within the benefit system. Uh, thank you, panellists, to my final word. Uh, 30 years of neoliberalism has destroyed talk of hegemonic structures within society. Individualism trumps society and success is self-generated. So uh, it's a culture of ego. I succeed, not because the playing field is tilted in my favour, but because I'm so brilliant. The flip side of this is that if you fail, that's also your fault. How much denial are we in? Jamie White was allowed to plagiarise a column claiming poverty doesn't really exist in New Zealand in our largest daily newspaper last year. And John Key claimed, also last year, the reason the poor fail was because they love drugs. We desperately need better answers and better leaders. Thank you, panellists, for participating, and thank you, Fano, for watching. We'll join you again 7pm tomorrow night for Waiti Fifth Estate, looking at the first day of Auckland Action Against Poverty's Beneficiary Clinic. This programme brought to you, of course, by Aotearoa Credit Union. Kia ora, New Zealand. Good night.